In this example, we'll be evaluating the strength of a tension member made up of a 6 inch wide by 1 inch thick bar made out of A572 grade 50 material. The bar is connected to a gusset plate at its end by six 7 8 inch diameter bolts arranged in two rows that are staggered as is shown here. The load is made up of 33 and a half kips dead load and 100 kips live load and we are asked to determine whether or not the member is adequate using the LRFD philosophy. This example is very similar to another example that I've worked and posted and I would encourage you to take a look at that example if you haven't seen it already and there should be a link in the video at this point. From that earlier example, we know that the equation that we're ultimately trying to evaluate is to determine whether the sum of gamma times Q is less than or equal to phi times R sub N. We want to know whether the factored loads that are acting on the member are less than or equal to the factored resistance. And you recall from the first example that we had a required strength, the sum of gamma times Q equal to 200 kips. The first limit state that we'll evaluate is that of a gross section yielding, and in this case, the nominal strength is taken as P sub N equal to F sub Y times A sub G. The yield stress is 50 KSI, and the gross area is 6 inches in width by 1 inch in thickness. This gives us a nominal strength of 300 kips, and applying the resistance factor of 0 0.9 for gross section yielding, we see that the design strength phi times P sub N is equal to 270 kips. The second limit state that we'll evaluate is that of a net section fracture or tensile rupture. And in this case, the nominal strength P sub N is equal to F sub U times A sub E, where A sub E is the effective net area taken as U times A sub N. U is the shear lag reduction coefficient, and for this case, with a simple bar connected to a gusset plate, U is taken as 1.0. When we evaluate the net area of the bar, A sub N is taken as W sub N times T, where W sub N is the net width of the plate taken as the gross width minus any material removed during the fabrication of the holes. We have a number of different paths that we can consider for our net section fracture, and the first one that I'll consider is a path that goes through the first bolt hole, bolt hole A. And when we evaluate the net width associated with that fracture path, we take the gross width, 6 inches, minus the material removed for one hole. That hole has a diameter of 7 eighths for the bolt plus a sixteenth of an inch, and then we add a second sixteenth of an inch for material that could be damaged during fabrication. And that leaves us with a net width of 5 inches. The second net section fracture path that I'll evaluate is one that passes through bolt holes A and B. And when we evaluate this fracture path, we take the net width, W sub N, as a gross width minus the material removed during the fabrication of the bolt holes, the sum of D effective. And then we add in the quantity S squared over 4G for each of the diagonal segments, each segment that is not perpendicular to the axis of the member. So in this case, the segment that passes be between bolt holes A and B is the diagonal segment and the value S is measured parallel to the axis of the member and the value G is measured perpendicular to the axis of the member. So S stands for the spacing between the two holes and G stands for the gauge between the two holes. So when we evaluate the net width for this fracture path, we take six inches, the gross width, we subtract out the material for two holes that were fabricated to accommodate the bolts, two times seven eighths plus a sixteenth plus a sixteenth. And then we add in the quantity S squared over four G, where S is one and a half inches and G is three inches. And ultimately we end up with a net width that's equal to 4.188 inches. The third fracture path that I'll consider is a path that passes between bolt holes B and C. And in this case, the net width W sub N is evaluated in a way that's very similar to the way that we evaluated the path that goes between holes B and A. So in this case, we take the net width as a gross width, six inches. We subtract out the area lost for two holes, uh, two times seven eighths plus a sixteenth plus a sixteenth. And then we add in the quantity S squared over 4G, where S is again one and a half inches and G is three inches. However, in this case, since 
one of the bolt holes, bolt hole A, is in front of the fracture path that's being considered, we have to apply a modification factor to the net width that we're calculating. In this case, one-sixth of the force is being transferred out of the member before we get to the fracture path passing between bolt holes B and C. So we apply a modification factor of six-fifths to the net width, and we end up with a net width W sub N equal to 5.025 inches. To help explain why this modification factor is needed, consider a free body diagram of the tension member in the joint. One of our assumptions is that each one of the bolts in the joint carries an equal share of the load that's in the member. So each one of the bolts in this case carries one-sixth of the load that's on the member. So if we were to evaluate the net section passing through bolt holes A and B, for example, then we find that the entire load that's in the member is present on that net section fracture path. However, if we evaluate the joint and consider net section fracture path that passes between bolt holes B and C, what you would find is that on that fracture path, we only have five sixths of the force that's in the member on that net section fracture path. One sixth of the force that's in that member is transferred out of the member through bolt A. So when we go back to our fundamental equation and uh, evaluate whether the sum of gamma times Q is less than or equal to phi times R sub N, we can substitute in P sub U for the sum of gamma times Q. And then ultimately at that net section, we only have five sixths of the load that's in the member on that net section. So rather than evaluate a different load at each one of the net sections, we bring that factor five sixths to the right hand side of the equation and it becomes six fifths. So when you evaluate a net section fracture path that has bolts that are in front of the path, then you have to use a modification factor that's equal to the total number of bolts divided by the number of bolts that are on the path or behind the path. So if we were to consider a net section fracture path that passes between bolt holes C and D at this point, our net width calculations would be very similar to the last two paths that we evaluated, except in this case, there are two bolt holes in front of that path. Bolt holes A and B are in front of the path that passes through bolt holes C and D. So now our modification factor becomes six fourths. Six is the total number of bolts in the joint and there are four bolts on or behind the, uh, the path that's being evaluated. So the net width associated with a fracture through bolt holes C and D has a value of W sub N equal to 6.281 inches. Again, to justify that value, consider the free body diagram shown here, where now we evaluate a path that goes through bolt holes C and D. So in this case, on that net section fracture path, we would see that there's only four sixths of the load that's in the member applied to that particular fracture path. So again, going back to our fundamental equation where P sub U has to be less than or equal to phi times R sub N, in this case, P sub U is four sixths times the load that's in the member. And we bring that over to the right hand side and four sixths becomes six fourths. And that's the, uh, the value that we use for evaluating the net section fracture strength associated with that fracture path. To be complete, we should also evaluate a fracture that passes through bolt hole B. And if we do that, then the net width is six inches minus one bolt hole. That bolt hole has a diameter of seven eighths plus one sixteenth of an inch. And then we add a second sixteenth of an inch for material that might be damaged during fabrication. And then we multiply by the modification factor six fifths because we have six bolts in total and five of those bolts are on or behind the net section fracture path that's being considered. Finally, when we consider all of the different net widths associated with the different fracture paths that we have evaluated, it's the lowest value of W sub N that governs. And so a path that passes through bolts A and B is going to be the critical net section fracture path.
So finally, we can evaluate the net area as W sub n times T. So A sub n in this case is equal to 4.188 inches squared. Then we can calculate the effective net area, which is U times A sub n. The effective net area is also 4.188 inches squared. Then we can evaluate the nominal strength calculated as the tensile, uh, the ultimate stress, 65 KSI times A sub E, and we get a value of P sub n equal to 272.2 kips. Finally, we can evaluate the design strength, and we find that uh, after applying a resistance factor of 0.75 for a net section fracture, we find that phi times P sub n is equal to 204.1 kips. Comparing the gross section yielding design strength, phi P sub n equal to 270 kips, with the net section fracture design strength, phi P sub n equal to 204.1 kips, we find that a net section fracture governs, and our available strength is phi times P sub n equals 204 kips. When we compare that to the required strength of sum of gamma Q equal to 200 kips, we find that the member in this configuration is satisfactory.